Welcome to the Becoming Ageless podcast, where we engage in extended conversations to promote a youthful biological age and improved health span. I'm your host, Robin Lynn Fredericks, holistic and integrative health practitioner. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode one, season two of the Becoming Ageless podcast, where my focus is not in learning how to not die, but in discovering ways to become a partner with my body and to pursue life. So live and to live out loud, no matter the number. In our episode today, we meet Sandra Kaufman, MD, who began her academic career in the field of cellular biology, earning a master's degree from the University of Connecticut in tropical ecology and plant physiology. Turning to medicine, she received her medical degree at the University of Maryland and completed a residency and fellowship at John Hopkins in the field of pediatric anesthesiology. For the last seven years, she's been the chief of pediatric anesthesia at the Joe DiMaggio's Children's Hospital and the Wellington Outpatient Facility in South Florida. Her avid interest in science of anti-aging began her many years ago as an intent hobby, utilizing her knowledge in cell biology, human pharmacology, and physiology. This hobby has now become a main focus. The Cosine Protocol represents years of non-clinical research leading to the first ever comprehensive theory of aging, complete with an explanation of why we age and the tools that we need to decelerate the process. She's the author, author of the Kaufman Protocol, Why We Age and How to Stop It, and her second book, Aging Solutions, which encompasses specific organ systems and so much more. Dr. Kaufman has been a guest speaker at many longevity conferences, radio shows, and podcasts, like this one. I do have to say that this is probably one of my favorite, favorite podcast episodes ever. Dr. Kaufman is both intelligent and funny, as well as a supreme aspirate and an all-around girl sprawl. If you're wanting to learn how to up your supplement game to support your healthy aging, this show is where you need to start. Follow it naturally by reading her books. You're definitely going to want to take notes and listen again, as I have. And with all my experts, Extended wealth span is what we're looking for, making our body a partner in our journey and giving us the ability to live a long, vibrant life full of love and adventure is the ultimate goal. With that in mind, on to the show. Sandy, welcome to the show. I am so excited to have you here and um, glean as much information off of you as we possibly can in our short amount of time. So how are you today? Have you been in in surgeries and everything all day today? I have actually. Yes. Uh, My day job, of course, I'm an anesthesiologist. Uh, uh, Unfortunately, uh, my longevity hobby has not grown into a job yet, but it is my absolutely uh, thing that's closest and nearest and dearest to my heart. So it is a joy to be on chatting with you about it. Yeah. Before I get started, I'm going to adjust the, the sound a little bit here. Um, I want, if you don't mind, to read just a minute from um, your protocol, your personal statement, because when I first read this, I have to be honest, I had, I immediately had a girl crush. It's like, <laughs> this, <laughs> this woman is, is my superhero, and I will follow her to the depths. Okay, you guys, so this is from her first book, The Kaufman Protocol. Um, why we age and how to stop it. And again, part of her personal statement, and I think it really speaks to who she is and what we're going to be talking about today. So starts out with, I am a physician, a scientist, a mother, and an athlete. But most importantly, I am a woman who decided a few years ago that I loved my life and I didn't want it destroyed by the seemingly inevitable thing we call aging. So rather than give in with grace, I decided to fight with grace. But people ask, why me? And the answer is simple. I know cells. I know research. I know the human body. I was determined. And now I know how to stop aging. (sighs) (laughs) All right. Let's talk about that. (laughs) (laughs) I guess it does seem a little bit preposterous when you read it out loud. (laughs) No, I, I love, I love that. Of course, you know, becoming ageless podcast, as well as my practice and holistic health, I'm all about finding ways to increase health span. I don't agree with 
you know, the standard philosophy of, you know, oh, aching bones and joints and, and high cholesterol and pl blood pressure, that's just inevitable, learn to deal with it and go silently into the night. I don't agree with that. And um, neither do you, apparently. I mean, you've got two books on the subject. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I think we're on the same page with this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's, let's just start from point A. How, why, what, how did you get into this? Um, so pretty simple stuff. I was a cell biologist before I went to med school. So my, my love is cells, but as my father pointed out, he's an endocrinologist. He's like, cells don't pay bills. So maybe <laughs> you should go to med school. So that, all right, not, not a bad idea. So I went to med school. Um, I have a potpourri of background. I did a year of neurosurgery. I did a year of general surgery. Uh, I ended up being a pediatric anesthesiologist. And the cool thing about having sort of a, a wide scientific background is you get a different um, viewpoint than other people. Right. So I have a cellular viewpoint mixed in with real doctor stuff mixed in with pharmacology and how medications and molecules affect your body and your cells. So it's kind of this neat come together of information, yeah. right? On top of that, I spent many years just like doing research in a bench. I don't do it anymore, but I did. And as a consequence, I kind of know how to read the studies. So if you take all that and you mix it together, and then you decide one day that aging is kind of for the birds, I set out on this ridiculous quest to figure it out. Um, you know, and, and there are many people out there trying to figure it out as well. But when I set out on this course, um, it wasn't very organized. The information was not readily available. And I sort of stuck my head in a hole and decided I was going to sort this out on my own come hell or high water. And so my philosophy is probably a little bit different than some of the going trends out there. Um, but, but I think I'm right. Kind of obnoxious to say, but, but, I, <laughs> but, but I think I'm right. I, I think you are definitely right on the money with this stuff. And I love how you've like really broken everything down to make it understandable to the layperson. You know, I mean, there are some big words thrown in there, but it is, you know, we are teetering on biology. You got to have some of those big words. But you really break it down and you even, you guys, she throws in these little humorous statements here or there that, you know, are, are um, slightly bit corny, like talking about the bone saying, you know, something bad isn't that humorous, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> I read that and I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> what is there to not love about her? So now, okay. So I love the fact also, as you stated, as is obvious, you are a woman who you are a Gen Xer, so am I. And, you know, we're looking at aging differently than perhaps our parents did and their parents. Um, so as a doctor, from everything that you've read, would you classify biological aging as a disease? That is such a hard question to mm -hmm. answer. Right, because it's failure of systems. Mm -hmm which does make it a disease, but it's a predictive failure of systems, yeah. right? And the way in Western medicine we design, uh, d define a disease is when a specific system fails. So for example, if the same cell fails in your heart versus your kidney, you have heart disease and that's a disease, yeah. right? If it fails in your kidney, all of a sudden you have kidney disease, but it's the yeah. same patholo pathological process that occurs absolutely everywhere. And somehow that's not a disease. So I would go out on a limb and say, it, it is a disease. It's kind of an inevitable disease. Uh, we can decelerate it significantly, but we can't cure it entirely at the moment. Yeah. Right. Cause that, that's the inevitable question. That's the inevitable. I mean, eventually, you know, we are going to come to our demise. Um, but you know, my goal personally is to do that living until I am like, I'm hiking the day before I, I leave this planet. <laughs> that is my own personal goal. I don't know if it's achievable, um, but I will, I will die trying to do that. <laughs> no, well, the, the joke around here is that I'm going to fall off a cliff when I'm about 120. Right. Because, and, and, and I will be fine with that. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That's, you know, I, that's my goal as well. And 120 is my number. 
Um, now you are a um, rock climber. Do you free climb? Oh God, no, no. I I am adventurous, but I'm not suicidal. Okay. No. I, mean, I I do trad climb. I climb outside. I also obviously I train inside. I do a lot of outdoor stuff. Uh, I climb high mountains, and I climbing, of course, is rock climbing and mountain climbing are, are two separate things, but. Uh, I do both. Okay. Um, I no, I do not go up without ropes because uh, that would clearly go against my life philosophy of try not to die, and and living to be one hundred and twenty. <laughs> yeah, I, those guys don't make it past thirty, forty. Like they're toast. <laughs> I mean, oh my god! You know, I I'm yeah. sure they die enjoying what they're doing, um, but that's not going to happen to me. Yeah, well, I'm I'm impressed already though at you know the very fact that you are mountain climbing or that you are rock climbing. Um, that's girlfriend. We're talking about major upper body strength. Yeah, I'm pretty strong. And you're, you're in your fifties. <laughs> there is nothing that's stopping you. Normally it's like, you know, as people start getting into their fifties, they start thinking, oh, I'm going to do yoga, which I love yoga. I do yoga daily, but that becomes a thing that everybody's like, oh, we need to slow things down and, and be gentle on our joints. So you are. Oh, no you are the living example. And, um, I want to kind of jump into this. I want to touch on both of your books. So sure. you guys, we might be flying through this because while I could keep her on here for like probably 10 hours, I don't think she would really appreciate that. You guys probably wouldn't either. So you want to make sure that you pick up both of her books so you can really go in depth on what we're talking about. Um, you break aging down into seven tenets. Can you briefly touch on those a little bit? Sure. Okay. I yeah. So so this is my three minute, seven tenet spiel. Okay. I do tend to fly through it. So just stop <laughs> me if I do it too quickly. Okay. Okay. So tenet one is issues with DNA, DNA right. alterations. And in this category, we talk about uh, telomere length because telomeres get shorter as your cells get as they reproduce, right? Two is epigenetic modification. As you get older, you have negative epi epigenetic modifications that must be altered, clearly. And then the last thing in the DNA category is failure of DNA structural integrity. Um, so we can address all of those things to sort of help your DNA along. Right. Category two, or tenant two is mitochondria. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows mitochondria as the powerhouse of the cell. Mitochondria fail for very specific reasons. Uh, number one, over the age of 40, people tend to have an NAD deficiency, which is easily curable. Uh, two, the electron transport chain creates free radicals, which are very dangerous. Your body makes endogenous free radical scavengers, uh, but that fails over the course of time. So your body is set up for oxidative damage, uh, which is huge. Uh -huh. uh, other things in the mitochondrial category. Uh, and they, they tend to overlap a little bit, so bear with me. So two and three, four and five control all of your mitochondrial processes. Um, so two and three is sort of like the powerhouse in this category. And it fails, uh, starts going down by the time you are 30. Mm -hmm. So we need to adjust our sir two and three levels. Okay. Uh, and then there's something called the mitochondrial transition pore. And it flickers when you are younger. It stays open while you are older. And controlling uh, the variability of that pore is crucial to controlling your mitochondria. Okay. All right. So that's tenant two. Tenant three is what I call pathways. And these are your sirtuins, seven mammalian sirtuins. I alluded to three, but one, three, and six are crucial to aging. Uh, in addition, your AMP kinase pathway, which is your metabolic master switch, which you activate when you undergo caloric restriction diets. And then of course, there's the mTOR pathway, which controls protein synthesis, um, blocking mTOR helps with longevity, but it also increases frailty. So uh, the whole rapamycin thing is a bit of a conversation right now out there. Uh, we can touch upon that later. Yeah. That's three. So tenant four, I call quality control. Okay. Uh, because if you think of your cells as factories, uh, the products aren't always as good as they should be because your machinery falls apart over time. So there are four DNA repair mechanisms that we need to keep track of. Uh, and then there's an entire process for keeping your proteins in line, a whole system of proteostasis, and then getting rid of proteins that uh, have gone a uh, And then autophagy in this, is in this category because it, it's part of quality control and recycling pieces and parts. Okay. 
So that's tenant four. Tenant five is what I call your, uh, it's your immune system that becomes your inflammatory system over the course of time, right? So as you get older, you are less uh, able to control infections and you become chronically inflamed. Of course, there's a term inflam inflammaging. It's very popular out there. Uh -huh. uh, and that leads to a whole host of issues, right? So that's all category five. Category six is kind of a grab bag. I call it individual cell requirements. It's the realization that all cells are not created equal. A red cell needs something different than a brain cell versus a liver cell. And we need to take very special care of our stem cells and of course, eradicate our senescent cells. Um, so then tenant seven, the last one is what I call waste management. And this is mostly glucose issues. It's glycation. Uh, glycation leads to a huge problem around our body. And I'm convinced that it's one of the big reasons that we age. So I have this whole system set up to anti-glycate. Uh, and then the last thing in this category is the accumulation of lipofusion, which is sort of cellular garbage that accumulates in long-lived cells that you don't, you just can't really get rid of. So trying to control lipofusion is like the last little piece. So in a very large nutshell, that would be the seven tenets of aging. You make it sound so easy. <laughs> Well, there it is. Ta -da! There it is. All right, we're right? done. Now. And you know, and people talk about. I mean, there's been, there's many ways to to categorize this stuff, right? People talk about the nine hallmarks, and I think they added a few more recently. And the problem is, as the list gets bigger and bigger, it's the game of whack a mole, right? right? And so I'm not denying that there are innumerable ways that we age, but they are all interconnected. And if you categorize them, it becomes a more of a controllable game rather than just mass chaos. Kind of and I up. think. The illusion that we're controlling it is what we need. Yeah, yeah no, no doubt about that. I, I like control. I'm a control freak. So that's all good with me. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's there's so much that's going into every single one of these tenants that, you know, as especially as you're just kind of spilling them out, I can hear my audience right now saying, well, wait, what was that? <laughs> what, what do I do? So is there one category, one tenant, one thing that mm -hmm. if you looked at it said, this is the most important thing to address. Would it be inflammation? Would it be? It's, it's person dependent. Yeah. Um, it's really, it's really challenging. So for example, and, and I do it by diseases, right? Okay. So if you're a normal person, I would argue that all the categories are probably equivalent. If you have some sort of concomitant medical problem, one category will stand out for you. Okay. So easiest example, if you're pre-diabetic or family history of diabetes, waste management is crucial, Okay. right? If you have a family history of several different types of cancer, one could argue that your DNA repair mechanisms is gonna be your key category. Right. So depending on who you are, we weight different categories. Yeah. And, and this sort of becomes important because if you get to the classification system of all of the different agents, um, longevity and sort of conquering diseases becomes a mathematical algorithm, which right. is how we then create protocols for everybody. And I right. think that's sort of like the crucial idea because the first part is all like gloom and doom. And then the second half is, oh yeah, we, we can address each of these things and there are answers. Right. Now, do you think that there's an age where this is no longer effective? Oh gosh, no. You can, you okay. can unless you're dead, everything is... <laughs> Is, is moderately fixable. I mean, it may not be completely fixable, but it's certainly, you know, you can make improvements at any time in any category. All right. So it's never too late. Of course not. Okay. I mean, unless you're in the ground, that's a problem. <laughs> right. Exactly. We, we don't want to go there. Um, okay. So again, you guys, she goes through every single one of those tenants in here. So I want to kind of skip ahead to book two. And in there, and then we'll come back and start talking about all the different agents and everything. But in book two, I really love how you said the most popular thing that people like to focus on is the big four, bone, brain, guts, and skin. Mm -hmm. So can we get into those? Let's talk, yeah. a little bit, let's talk a little bit about bone, bone health. Of course, we know it's important. Women talk about it all the time as they're in the menopause, um, but it's important for men too. Um, talk a little bit about why bone is so important to our longevity, other than well, so, so let me back up just a little bit. 
Okay. So when I wrote book one from a cellular perspective only, mm -hmm. it was on the assumption that all cells are roughly equivalent around your body, okay. right? A cell is a factory. Um, it has a job to do. It makes proteins and enzymes. Um, and either it works or it doesn't work. So you need to fix all of them and therefore all of your body parts will improve, right? Makes sense. Right. Um, when I started making protocols for people, they would say, yeah, yeah, I get that, but, right? It was always the but. Uh -huh. Yeah, but I'm worried about my osteoporosis. I'm worried about my gut. So in book two, what I did is every time that there's a study testing out all the hypotheses, they would utilize a particular body system. Um, so I can only address systems that were researched, right? Right. And so as an example, naringenin is known to help bone. Mm -hmm. So every study is about bone. Does it help with your, your middle ear? Probably, but no one's looked at it, right. right? So whenever there was significant evidence in a particular body system, I put it into book two so that you could cross-reference things by body systems that you were looking to improve. Okay. Um, and when I built protocols, those were the big four. That's what everyone asked about, right? Okay. So bone was crucial. And the key about bone is it, like every other piece of tissue, it's constantly changing. It's constantly reorganizing. So it's not like you get what you get and then you're done. Right. You, you've got cells that are breaking things down and then cells that are building them back up all the time, right? So osteoclasts break cells down or break down bone and osteoblasts build them. Mm -hmm. And as you are young, you have more blasts than class. Uh, when you are sort of normal-ish in your in your period of time between what sixteen and thirty some, it's about equivalent. And then as you surpass thirty five, your osteoclasts are more active than your osteoblasts, so you become osteopenic. And then of course, when menopause hits, there's estrogen receptors on these cells. You really start taking a dive, right? So then the question is, how do we control these these things? Right. Um, so the first thing we have to do is decrease the activity of osteoclasts. And it turns out that osteoclasts are very sensitive to inflammation. All of the interleukins uh, that cause inflammatory systems around your body activate your osteoclasts. Okay. So all of the anti-inflammatories actually will decrease the activity of those clasts. And that's very helpful. At the same time, we want to activate your osteoblasts. And there are agents that do that as well. So there's a combination of things that we can sort of do to increase bone activity. Okay. Um, get, <laughs> is that what you you're looking into, for? Do you want to get into agents? We, we can do whatever you want. Um, let's do summaries and then let's get into agents and just really nosedive. Yeah, sure. Well, okay. I, will, I will tell you just because everyone asks about bone, right? Yeah. So the big two when we're looking at bone is actually naringenin. Uh -huh. um, it comes from oranges. It's... Um, uh, it's it's pretty common, common to find, uh, but it's incredibly good for your osteoblasts. Okay. Um, and I, I tell people not to live by my example. I'm a bit of a junk food junkie, and I'm a diet coke addict. Um, and I I admit it publicly. Oh. Yes, I know it is terrible. Um, but what I tell people is I am addicted now to osteoblastic activators to offset my bad habits. So <laughs> naringenin is huge on my list. Okay. So that's a good osteoblastic activator, as is lactoferrin. Okay. Very, very, very good for your bones. Okay. I'm making notes, even though I have the book. <laughs> okay. You've got the book sitting there, but that's I've okay. I've got that's, the book sitting here, but notes. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. And um, so that's to, to activate the blast. What about the deactivating? So any of the anti-inflammatories are actually really good okay. to get rid of the osteoclastic activity. Okay. Um, so uh, curcumin is, is one of my absolute favorites in right. terms of inflammatory issues. Right. I mean, there are okay. many, but that's, that's my favorite. Many. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. All right. Uh, brain. So brain is really interesting, right? Everyone is worried because their parents have some sort of senile dementia or they think they're losing their memory, right? This is huge. And the brain is really interesting because it uses up more oxygen than any other organ, uses up more glucose than any other organ, right? So now we work about worry about glycation and oxidative issues, right? So it's yeah. hugely, it's set up to be traumatized. Yeah. It has fewer free radical scavenging capacities and it's protected by the blood brain barrier. 
So it is just a setup for failure, right? Right. So we need to make sure we choose agents that control glycation, uh, control free radical scavenging, but make it through the through the blood brain barrier. It's very important. Um, and the other thing we worry about is you make memories in your hippocampus. And so we really worry about hippocampal plasticity. Okay. So we're looking for agents that cross the blood brain barrier, help with neuroinflammation uh, and increase uh, plasticity. Okay. Um, yeah. Now I take uh, like, for example, magnesium threonine. Three and eights. Three and eights. Yeah. That's supposed Perfect. to cross through there. And I have noticed if I take it before bed, oh, my, my dreams are like, I, it's, I dream all night long. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fantastic right yes. and, and it's funny so so 60 percent of the population is magnesium deficient uh-huh. right um there's many many formulations magnesium has to be you know with something right. magnesium oxalate magnesium this that the other the only one that makes it through the blood brain barrier is magnesium threonate um, it was invented by, I forget who invented it. I want to say Dartmouth, but I probably, I'm, I may be wrong about that. Anyway, some very smart people came up with magnesium three and eight. Um, it's sold as mag teen. And then people put it in a variety of supplements. It's the same stuff. It comes from the same company. Um, but it's incredibly good because number one, you get all the benefits of magnesium on top of increasing neuroplastic plasticity. So it does, it gets through to, to your brain and it's extremely beneficial. And yeah, man, does it make you dream? It's pretty cool. It does. It does. And that helps to really kind of help the brain to detoxify too. So we need those dreams. We need that dream state. Um, yeah. Now what about like with, with the brain? We're hearing so much with, you know, that wonderful virus that's still haunting us out there with COVID. A lot of people are getting, you know, what they're calling COVID brain, where they're getting yeah. a lot of that fogginess that's just hanging out and not going away. Um, any of the agents that we're talking about help with that kind of fogginess just kind of hanging out? So the question is, is what is the etiology of the fogginess? And I don't know if anyone's actually figured it out. My best guess would be neural inflammation because it's an incredibly inflammatory virus, right. you know, and, and don't, don't quote me on this. Don't, you know, I, it's, it's just a working hypothesis um, because it does cause a lot of vascular inflammatory issues. Why it's why people are having heart attacks without vascular or without coronary disease, uh -huh. Uh, testicular torsion is huge in the population with post COVID because it's inflammatory in, in the, in the blood vessels there. So I'm, I'm pretty convinced that it has to do with vascular inflammatory issues in the brain. Right. So as a consequence of that, anti-inflammatory should be incredibly helpful, uh, as well as inflammatory processes within the brain tissue itself. Mm -hmm. So the answer is anti-inflammatories that cross the blood brain barrier. And does um, curcumin do that? Curcumin does very helpful uh, as well. It also stays in the vasculature. So it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier necessarily, but it does control blood that's getting to the brain. So okay. that helps. Okay. Right. Uh, and one of my favorite things that gets to the brain uh, that also helps is andrographolide. Okay. It tastes terrible. It is so ridiculously bitter. Um, it is the last okay. pill in my pill jar that I take. Cause I just dread taking it. Um, and then you get I this nasty liquid. <laughs> Oh, oh, that'd be even worse. Oh, gross. No, I don't. <laughs> My husband doesn't know how I do it. Um, okay. So when, what is that doing? So it's an anti-inflammatory. Um, we know that it gets into your neural tissue. So it's basically a neural anti-inflammatory and it also has some um, ability to increase neural plasticity. So I love it for brain issues. We like that. Um, okay, let's move on to guts. So the gut That's is definitely. tough. Oh, yeah. the gut is tough, right? So if you think about the gut, it is a very long tube mm -hmm. that goes from top to bottom. And it's just very, very long and very varied as you as you move along it, right? I, li I like to picture it as sort of like the outside of the world being inside of you, right? Pretty much, so, yeah. Right? It is, it is not you. It, mm -hmm. is, it is outside world. Right. Mm -hmm. So within that, several, several things to think about. So number one, there's this huge population of bacteria in there. Some are good and some are bad. Mm -hmm. And they essentially control what gets into your body. They're the gatekeepers. So whatever food you eat, they sort of help digest it on top of your other enzymes. Right. 
Uh, so what you're eating controls their population and then what metabolites they spit out get into you. So you have to think about what gut stuff you have. Uh-huh. Some people love to take probiotics all the time. Some people like to take, well, there's prebiotics and probiotics. And then of course, you know, whatever. Um, if you have a healthy gut, keep it. It's great. You don't have to take probiotics every day. Uh-huh. Um, if you take a course of antibiotics and you kill all the happy bugs in your gut, then you probably do need a boost to keep that population healthy. Yeah. Um, but it's just something to, something to think about. Yeah. So then you talk about your intestinal wall. And of course, as you go down the track, it all does different things, right? So your stomach has to be very acidic, uh, breaks things down, um, which means that some things that you don't want to break down get broken down and, and the opposite can occur. So that's, you know, stomach is very interesting. As you get to your intestine, it's all about absorption of nutrients. What do you want in? What do you want out? And how solid is that barrier? As you get older, that barrier falls apart right? So we need to keep our intestinal cells as healthy as humanly possible. And what's sort of interesting is like alpha ketoglutarate, I, I, I love and adore it. It's fantastic. Most of it, as you take it, gets absorbed into your intestinal cells. Only 20% of what you take and actually gets into the rest of your body, but it makes your intestinal cells so much happier, increases the barrier so that it keeps out a lot of the toxins. Right. And one of the reasons that you're systemically inflamed over time, I mean, it comes for many reasons, but one of the reasons is that as your intestinal barrier falls down, you absorb all the evil metabolites and then they become sort of systemically toxic. So nursing that bacteria, that, that wall is incredibly important. Yeah, I would, I would totally agree with that. I mean, just from the standpoint of, you know, any of those little holes that are getting through that. Um, or the the foods and everything getting through that, it, it can create major problem and especially create things like autoimmune, you guys, your body starts getting into that attack mode and staying in that attack mode, which means inflammation, even more of it. Um, okay. What, what major tip do you have for that? So I, so here, here's the easiest one, aloe vera. Uh, we've known about it for thousands of years. It's good uh-huh. for your skin. It is amazing for your GI tract. Okay. Um, you don't want to just eat the plants because number one, it tastes absolutely terrible. <laughs> uh, but you want you want to take the uh, the pills or the capsules because it helps your intestinal wall. It helps the balance of GI bugs. Uh, it keeps your intestinal wall extremely healthy. Increases the butyrate, which actually helps with epigenetic issues. Um, it is just an all round, completely benign, fantastic, uh, thing for your gut It's okay. anti-inflammatory. It does so many positive things. And I got to tell you when I don't take it for a few days, mm-hmm. my gut is so unhappy with me. Mm. And, and of course, you know, it's good for your skin. It's just, it's just good for everything. Amazing. Yeah. I did really a study. I, I read it many years ago that was saying, if you had a tablespoon of aloe vera gel that had actually started reversing wrinkles within like six weeks or something. And yeah. I started doing an experiment. And of course at that time, you know, everybody's like, Oh no, you want the, the actual gel, get it from the plant. I'm, I was doing it. I'm like skinning my, my aloe and eating it. And I really did see a result, but you're right. It, it doesn't taste good. It feels, no, it, like, terrible. it feels like snot. <laughs> <laughs> So what's interesting is, so I, I have this silly thing where every Sunday to sort of like, I don't know, it, it, slightly cathartic, right? I take a bath every Sunday night, put on Netflix, drink a margarita, but I crush aloe leaves. I've destroyed every aloe plant in this house um, and, and I soak in it. Nice. And it is, it is amazing for your skin. So the whole oh, wow. plant is great for your skin. Yeah. The whole plant is just not great for your gut. For your gut. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would have to agree with that. That was, Yeah. We'll move on because we don't want to get into that one. Um, okay, so <laughs> <laughs> aloe for the gut. All right, and speaking of skin, skin is number four. Every woman wants to know how to make their skin better. Yes. Every woman. So skin is really interesting um, because it gets it gets abused from the inside and the outside, right? So that's that's uh-huh. that's bad. But you can also help it from the outside and the inside. Right. So you have many layers. There's the obviously the epidermis on top. There's the epidermal dermal junction, which is the sort of vacillating junction. Um, And then below below the junction is the dermis. And the dermis has all the good stuff. It has the blood vessels. It has the collagen. This is where all the fibroblasts live. 
So the key here is we need to keep the dermis as healthy as possible, okay. right? As you are, when you are young, uh, the dermal epidermal junction that vacillates, and if you looked at it in three dimension, it would look like egg crates. Right. Um, so it has a lot of surface area, right? So stuff from the outside can get in, right? And consequently stuff from the outside or the inside can also get out. So right. as you are younger, it doesn't topical and systemic treatments are both very, very, very helpful. As you get older, that flattens out. And it's one of the reasons when you look at old people's skin, you know, they touch something and it just sort of shimmies off because the, that, that junction is, is, is gone. So now it's just flat, ah. which, which means that the, the surface area decreases, which means that whatever you put on topically is less likely to get to the dermis and whatever you take in the dermis is less likely to get to the epidermis. Hmm. So it's, it's there are all these double-edged swords when it comes oh, yeah. to skin. So takeaway messages is are when you are young, take as good as care of your skin as possible um, because you want to, you want to keep what you have. Right. And when you're already older, then you really got to play the game of like attack both as much as possible. Right. Is there any way, can we, can we get the waviness back? I don't know if that waviness is reversible or not. I know you can extend it, but I'm not sure about reversibility. Hmm. We need to do some tests on this. <laughs> yes, 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 we do. But it's it's really quite interesting because the 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 waviness just increases surface area. And the more surface area you have, the more treatment ability you have, which is where, so if you are older, transdermal patches are not going to be effective as if you are younger, oh, wow. right? It's just, okay. it's just right? Let's apply okay. cells to life. Right. right. So it's, it's, it's really sort of quite interesting if you look at the physiology. So what's kind of cool is fibroblasts are the main cells that live in your dermis. Mm -hmm. And that's what you want to sort of keep healthy because the fibroblast makes the collagen, it makes the elastin, it makes all of the um, sort of structural units that keep your skin as healthy as possible. And what I find humorous is people always say, oh, drink 17 gallons of water a day. Of course, I'm exaggerating it's because your skin doesn't look hydrated anymore and that's completely garbage as far as i'm concerned okay the reason skin doesn't look hydrated is because your fibroblasts don't make hyaluronic acid anymore hyaluronic acid is a molecule that sucks in water mm -hmm. so for every molecule of hyaluronic acid you've got six to seven thousand molecules of water stuck to it it's like a molecular sponge so if you don't have hyaluronic acid in your skin you're not going to retain the 17 gallons of water that you drank you're just going to pee like a racehorse <laughs> so you need to put back in your body the ability to retain the water, gotcha. right? Okay. And what's really interesting as an example about hyaluronic acid is when you eat it, it doesn't actually go to your skin and sit there. Right. And it does a little bit, but not a lot. If you inject it, that's another story. But what it really does systemically is it goes to your fibroblasts and it sends cellular messages to make more hyaluronic acid. So it's a cellular signaling system. Okay. And when you do that, um, you retain more water. And so you look more, you know, hydrated, more hydrated, more glowy. And what about topical? It depends again on the absorption. If you are older, it's not going to absorb as quickly. Um, and it's, and it's also, it's a catch because you want longer chain hyaluronic acid, same with collagen. You want the longer, bigger stuff because it sucks right. in more water, but the bigger it is, the less likely it's going to permeate through your skin transdermally. Okay. Right. So short stuff absorbs, but it's less effective. So right. it's sort of like this game of what's good and what's bad. Right. The other thing is that short chains are a bit more inflammatory than long chains. So ask about that. Right. So is it good? Is it bad? It's <laughs> it's 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 sort of you know it's sort of a mix. So I tend to stick with mostly orals. Okay. Um, you know, I will, I will, will put on some eventually, you know, occasionally, but that's not my main use of hyaluronic acid. Right. Right. Well, you are very glowy. So what you're doing is working, obviously. Well, thank you. Yes, absolutely. And on, on a side note, I did hear in one of your podcasts, I, did, I didn't write down what you do. You said that you have a, a mixture that you put on like one oh, yeah. thing. Oh yeah. Come on, come on, share. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> we can't be all no, arguments. So, let's, let's talk girl stuff here for a minute. No, no, no. So it's it's so funny. So it started out as um 
you know, you you read like I'm I'm the same as every other woman, right? We read all the cosmetic stuff and we go, ooh, this agent's really useful. And then you read the ingredient percentage and it's nothing, right? It says, oh, like, you know, you know, collagen or peptides or whatever. And it's infinitesimally small in any product. So I'm like, well, that's kind of bogus. So I started mixing up my own. Mm -hmm. So it's this fantastic stuff and I call it swamp juice, but my sister has now banned me from calling it swamp juice because she wants to sell it in a vial and call it like mystic something, something, which eventually maybe we will. But in, in essence, it's, it's aloe vera, it's aloe juice, mm -hmm. um, some hyaluronic acid, uh, uh, white tea extract, and then centilla and some peptides. And it's, it's a whiff slightly greenish. So it looks a little swampy. Um, but I put it in a spray bottle and I spray my body down twice a day. Oh, wow. Nice. Okay. So, so how do we find peptides? I order them in bulk from companies. Okay. <laughs> like my, my garage looks a bit like a pharmaceutical company, sort of like there's all this stuff because the other goofy stuff that I make, I decided that there needed to be a water soluble formulation and then an oil soluble formulation. So that's the water soluble. Okay. Um, and then the other thing I do is I make a, a body butter, which is green tea, butter, shea butter, um, green tea, shea, coconuts, astaxanthin, um, and then a few other goofy things. Melt it all together, foam it up, um, and then I just lather it on when I'm in the shower. All right, so well, moisture. when you guys decide to package this all up and, and decide on the Mystic River name or whatever you're going to do, make sure that I am on the list. No problem. Um, I will be the first and um, yeah, we'll get that. We'll get that stuff out there. Okay. So we've talked about the big four. We've touched on the seven tenants. Now, both of your books are chock full of agents that we can use. Um, and you know what? I meant to count how many agents there all are in all. Do you, do you know? That's a good question. I think... There's 28, I think, in book two, 14 to 15-ish in book one. Mm -hmm. The problem is that I'm constantly doing this. So I think there's 40-some on the internet, maybe, um, because it's just this constant turnover. Yeah. Uh, my, my absolute ridiculously kind of crazy hobby is I love tracking down agents, and I love finding um corners that we haven't hit so right now i am obsessed with sir two and three activators mm -hmm. oh is that the the um i don't know how to pronounce it you posted a photo on of a coil yes, yes i i got that based yes. off of your instagram and um you guys have been using it for like three days and i'm noticing sleeping much deeper like i mean bam mm -hmm. i am out you're never going to wake up with all the stuff i'm giving you <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh my yeah, gosh. It's, it's yeah. I, I can compete with you with supplements. I am over 50 now. Ooh, ooh that's, you're getting good. I'm uh -huh. up to 70, but okay. I take a lot of actual drugs too. So okay. I'm not sure how they, um, so Hana coil, uh, which is what you're talking about is uh -huh. it's so funny. So I was obsessed. I decided that we all have our sirtuin ones pretty well taken care of, right? Between the resveratrol or the pterostilbene or the parvoflora. We got, we have sirtuin one, like in the bag. Right. Um, three, excuse me, three is incredibly interesting because again, it lives in your mitochondria. It's three, four, five, uh -huh. um, but it's the master regulator. It controls 84 different mitochondrial proteins. And we know that by the time you are 30, so two and three starts to drop 30, right? That's just, that's a baby. Cute, right? People don't even think about aging at that point. Yeah. Uh -uh. Um, we also know that it's the only one that if you activate it will increase human lifespan. So as far as I'm concerned, it is the stepchild that has been ignored ignored far too long. So I am on this escapade to find the best sirtuin three activators. And Hanakoil or Hanokiol, people pronounce it sort of differently, comes from Magnolia. And I was on a search for the best one, which led me to that company that I posted um, from the Netherlands. Uh -huh. um, and I, I found them. I'm like, wow, how do they know this? This is fantastic. It turns out they didn't. It turns <laughs> out that it's really good for cancer stuff. And when I sent them an email saying, you know, this is a really potent SIR2 and 3 activator. And they said, it's a what? <laughs> 
I said, well, I think your marketing is all wrong. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's, it's a fantastic brand and they seem to be really good people and it's an amazing product. So I'm like, all right. So now I am actively activating my Sir two and threes. I love that. I love that. Can you, can we kind of backtrack a minute and Sir two ones are such a hot topic. Can you tell us what each one does briefly? Uh, sure. Okay. Sure. Sort of like this is like hours of lecture. Um, <laughs> so there are there are seven mammalian sirtuins, okay. right? And like anything in science, we know most about number one. That's why it's number one. Number one, and it controls most of your cellular homeostasis. Okay, it lives in your nucleus, and it controls everything from how many free radical scavengers you make to your DNA repair mechanisms to how you process fats to your circadian rhythms. Um, if you are, so one of the interesting things about getting older is that people tend not to sleep, mm -hmm. right? And your circadian rhythms are controlled by your sirtuins that we know decline over time. So as soon as people activate their sirtuins, they start sleeping better and they start doing better. And what's also interesting about that is at night, 30% of your proteins are made. So if you are not sleeping, you are now 30% protein deficient, and therefore you're just going to unravel and go down the negative hole, right? So by the time you get sirtuin one activated, you're doing just amazing things all around yourself. Uh, what is what are what is a sirtuin? That's another question, right? So it is a it is an it is a gene that makes an enzyme that removes acetyl groups from lysine. Okay. Right. Sounds so it actually turns things on by removing stoppages at lysine groups. Okay. Right. So okay. it's just an enzyme. Right. They, they have very far reaching effects. So sirtuin one is active in every cell of your body almost, um, controlling most of your cellular homeostasis. Nice. Okay. So do you have a, do you have an agent for that one? So, so two and one, so was Veritrol and pterostilbene are okay. the ones that most of the research is done on. Uh, there was a study or two that suggested that pterostilbene was not great if you had, um, a bad lipid profiles. So resveratrol is probably better off in that instance. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the bioavailability is terrible. Um, but because people know that it's so useful, um, there's an escalating war of who can make the most bioavailable resveratrol. Gotcha. The other key to this is that sirtuins require NAD as a cofactor. Mm -hmm. So if you are NAD deficient, which most people are by the time you are 40, upping your sirtuins isn't going to help unless you take NAD or some sort of NAD precursor. Right. And um, is, is one better than the other? Because we hear... And, um, and R and M and NMN, which is now so controversial. Um, there's, there's right. So off. it's, it's, they are one enzymatic step apart. Okay. So in reality, I don't think there's a difference. Okay. Um, you know, if you ask anyone that's, that's being paid by any of those two companies or whatever, they're going to say, Oh, ours is definitely better. Yeah. Does it really make a difference? I don't think so. There's never been a head to head trial that I'm aware of. And I don't think there ever will be because it's going to put the other company out of business. Yeah. Um, obviously Chromadex makes NR NMN is made by a variety of companies. David Sinclair is a huge fan of it. Of course, now it's going to be turned into a drug versus a supplement by the FDA. So that's a huge problem, which means that my guess would be that Chromadex stock is going to skyrocket. So I bought it, but that's uh -huh. just, yes, I don't know, but there are many ways to get precursors in there. There's injections, there's nasal spray, there's transdermal, because everyone knows that you become NAD deficient over time and it's extremely important. Okay. So that's just, there are many choices, you know, there's okay. IVs, there's this, there's that. Anyway, okay. so, so that's a wormhole. So yeah. you need NAD for sirtuin. Sirtuin number one is the most important and it lives in your nucleus. Okay. Two. Two is less important for aging, so we're going to jump over it. Okay. Three, four, and five live in your mitochondria. Okay. Uh, so, so, so two and three is actually made in your nucleus, and it's inactive. It goes to your mitochondria. It gets a piece of it taken off, and then it becomes active. It controls 84 different proteins, plus or minus. It's incredibly important for your mitochondrial uh, function. For example, if your sir two and three drops, your mitochondrial transition pores open and the mitochondria die and then your cells die. So it is extraordinarily important. Right. 
Uh, four and five are sort of helper sirtuins. Okay. They have slightly different activity, um, but you definitely need them. Six is the other important one for longevity. It lives in your chromatin. It's sort of an assistant-ish to one, uh, but it does more stuff with stem cells and progenitor cells and cholesterol metabolism, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, so you also need to activate six, but then, then we're getting into the, the hairy details of how many things do you actually want to take. Um, sign it in is a very active six activator. Um, so I was taking that for a while and then I'm like, eh, I'll circulate them. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then seven, eh, <laughs> one, 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 three and six are the crucial ones for longevity. Okay. Okay. Very cool. Thank you for doing that for us. Cause I'm, it's, again, it's one of those things that everybody talks about that everybody, you know, all the lay people are back here like, Mm-hmm. Cert one, heard of that, but then they can't tell you anything about it. So thank you. Right. Like well, so the key here, that. so just say that they are histone deacetylases. There, 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 there's the catch term so people can sound smart. There you go. Take okay. the acetyl group off of lysines from histones that allows proteins to function. How about that? Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Then. Okay. All right. So now, okay, we've got you're on 70 something, 70 plus supplements. I'm on 50 plus <laughs> supplements. <clears throat> now, of course I do believe in diet. You guys, I am a holistic practitioner. I believe in diet. Um, but you're, you're a junk food junkie, admittedly so. And so can you sit back and eat whatever you want and not exercise and take some of these agents and expect a good results? So the answer is yes and no. Okay. If you wanted to absolutely be optimal, you would exercise a lot. You would eat very well and you would take your supplements and you'll have the healthiest person that is possible, but you may or may not be a happy person. <laughs> True. Right. True. You've got to have some leeway there. Pick your, pick your poison. Yeah. You know, people ask me, do I have to stop drinking wine? And the answer is, if it makes you happy to have a little wine, have a little wine. Yeah. Right. There's some diehard smokers out there. Is smoking bad for you? Of course it's bad for you. It's terrible for you. But if you are going to smoke, know what the problems are and do your best to sort of overcome them. So for example, for every puff of smoke, there's like 3 billion free radicals. Right. Right. So. I load them up with free radical scavengers, right? So, and and granted, I exercise like crazy. I do something every day. I rock climb. I swim a mile every other day. You know, I I, I bike. I, I do many, 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 many things. I get my kill my body with a stupid thing called a catalyst suit. Um, I'm a bit of a, a nut when it comes to exercise. What is a catalyst suit? Oh, this is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's one of those muscle stimulator suits. Okay. Um, so it, it looks a bit like a Laura Croft outfit. It's kind of, it's <laughs> it's not very becoming, I have to say. Um, but there's this little outfit that you put on underneath of it. It's like black underwear. And then it's a jacket, like a vest, and then this pantsy thing. And it's got these armbands and it's electrified. Uh-huh. So, so as you are exercising on the, so there's an app and of course it walks you through whatever exercise program you want and it's 20 minutes. So for four seconds on and then four seconds off, your body gets sort of like, um, and it's, it's, it'll, it, it's the most amazingly bizarre workout ever. Cause as you are doing things, it is like killing your muscles. So when you get done, you are exhausted and it's, 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 you know, it's titratable. So you can do like a little bit of zappage or a ton of zappage, depending on like, you know, how much you want to die the next day. Um, but you know, if you only have a half an hour to exercise, it's, it's a fantastic opportunity. Okay. Well, speaking of zapping, since you're familiar with this, it's like you, you've got a lot of the facial treatments now that, that at home facial treatments that you can zap and get that electrical currents going. Is, is that good? How, do you know anything about those? So I, I, I so of course I have one because I have everything. Of course. Of course. Of course. Um, and, and I think it's actually, it is a good thing and it does two major things. Number one, it kills some bacteria on your skin. So if you tend to be acne prone, mm-hmm. I think that's really quite helpful. Okay. Um, and it increases blood flow to your skin and muscles. Okay. Is it going to kill the good guys though? The good bacteria? So, so the answer is it's going to kill it way less than all these people putting on antibacterial soap. Oh yeah. Right. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I 
I can't, (laughs) I cannot stand that. Right. Well, you're right. You're absolutely right. We have good bacteria all over us. Right. And I would argue that as soon as you do this, your bacteria is back for the most part. But if you have acne, cystic acne, it it kills the, like my teenager uses it and it significantly helps with their acne. I use it. I don't know how much it tightens your skin, but it definitely increases blood flow you know, to your skin, to your muscles. I think it really does help with a sort of a youthful appearance. Okay. Okay. I have one in the cabinet. My sister was just asking me about that actually. And I'm like, I've never even used it. Look, it's still in the box. <laughs> you know, it's kind of fun. It feels kind of good. It's like, you know, yeah. you know, I do when I'm watching Netflix or whatever. Okay. It's kind of fun. All right. Yeah. That, that was just a side little note there, you guys. Um, okay. okay so-, so anyway, so, so back to your question, <laughs> I exercise like nuts mm-hmm. and I take a ton of supplements. Um, but I eat whatever I want. And the reason I do that is I like to. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, but I, you know, I've tested myself. All of my levels of absolutely everything are absolutely fine. I take a very complex system of things to block all glucose. So all of the donuts that I eat, and I eat donuts every day, I block the I block <laughs> the carbohydrates, I block all the glycation. You know, I'm on 67 anti-diabetic medications just for fun. <laughs> I get away with it. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it, but I get away with it. So pick your poison. You don't have to be perfect, right? Because that's a take-home message. Enjoy what you enjoy and then make up for it in other categories if you can. Yeah, yeah. No, I I agree with that. I don't normally eat donuts every single day, girl. Oh, they're delicious. Apple fritters with the goo. Oh, delicious. I cannot let my husband listen to this show. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness. Okay. All right. Well, now let's get back to some of those, those supplements of the agents that your books talk about. Um, I know that you have um, a little saying that you use that you, you were talking about some of the most important ones that I've heard you talk about. Um, can you give us that? Sure. So I tried to give people the most information possible so that they could create their own protocols. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and clearly I think I gave people too much uh, benefit of the doubt because I would go through all of these systems. Like here are 44 agents that you can choose from. And they're like, yeah, give me top five. <laughs> <All right. laughs> okay, fine. So I came up with what I call the panacea. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's simply, it's not exactly the panacea and truly it's not, if you define the word panacea, it's not it, but it was an easy way to remember them. Right. Um, Right. So the first one is P, obviously it's pterostilbene, which the idea is you need to activate your sirtuins like we talked about. Right. So you either need pterostilbene or resveratrol. And obviously there are pros and cons to each one, but just for the sake of uh, my mnemonic, it's pterostilbene. Okay. Uh, PA, A stands for astaxanthin. Mm-hmm. Astaxanthin is my absolutely most favorite free radical scavenger in the world. Um, it activates your NRF2, so you get all the increases in your in your free radical or your endogenous free radical scavenging as well. It's an anti-inflammatory. Uh, it can increase your IgA. Just a fantastic molecule. Um, comes and from it's great for skin health too. It is amazing for everything. I think it should be in the drinking water. Someone asked me once if I could be any molecule, what would I be? And I said, I'd be astaxanthin. It's just the coolest. I love that. <laughs> there are no side effects. It's prevalent in nature. It comes from pissed off algae. Uh-huh. It's just, it's just fantastic. Yeah. Um, anyway, and there's no side effects at all. You can't, I mean, I've taken a ton and I have not turned orange. Um, so I think it's amazing. And you even live in Florida. So if you're not orange. Well, and the other interesting thing is if you take it, um, it was amazing. It does get into your skin mm-hmm. and it blocks inflammatory issues and it blocks DNA damage. So when you are in the sun in Florida, especially mm-hmm. you get less red. That helps. Um, and I frequently talk about this. My redheaded daughter is in the sun all the time playing tennis. She doesn't burn when she takes her astaxanthin. Yeah. You know, it's, it's That's the amazing. running joke around here. My kids are always like, Oh my God, have I had my astaxanthin? And their friends think they're nuts. Um, but they'll be out on a boat and they're the only kids that don't get suntans or sunburns. I love that. I've I've never even heard of that one. That is awesome. I love that one. Uh, so that's P a, uh, Uh N right. And the panacea N is next. That's obviously it's a nicotinamide. Uh Uh, and obviously it's the precursor. We need to make more NAD. That one's easy. Uh, my analogy sort of doesn't 
quite keep going at this point, but there's two C's now. So the right. first one is, is a uh, carnosine. Mm-hmm. Carnosine is a dipeptide. We all have it in our bodies. It's naturally acting. Uh, men have more than women. Young people have more than older people. It does several things. Number one, it's in your muscle and it sucks up the lactic acidosis when you exercise. So if you take extra, your, your muscles don't burn, which I love as an athlete. Uh, and the second thing is it's a transglycosylating agent. So when you have glucose that's becoming an AGE, which is a se- like six to seven step non-enzymatic process, it can actually lift some glucose off of your proteins and then you excrete it. So it's a transglycosylating agent. So it's fantastic uh, in that regard. Okay. Um, and then the last C is, is curcumin, like we talked about. Right. And people always say, oh, I take turmeric or turmeric. Like, isn't that good enough? And the answer is No. Um, because, uh, curcumin is the active ingredient and only two to 5% of turmeric is actually curcumin. And the half-life is very, very, very short, which makes the bioavailability terrible. Um, but there are escalating competitions of different companies to make a more bioavailable form. Um, you know, everyone just sends me a new one all the time and says, is this okay? And I'm always like, as long as it's bioavailable, uh, my favorite, Mm -hmm. huh? I was just no, my favorite comes down. from a company called Rev Genetics. Um, okay. uh, it's 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 277 times more bioavailable, and the reason I know that is there's a huge 277 written on the bottle, so it's fantastic <laughs> advertising. Um, but I can tell you that it's very bioavailable because if I take three, I start turning yellow. So uh-huh. I know that it works. Yeah, yeah. So now, what what is something that somebody can look at on their label to see if it is? Is it black pepper, ginger? So, so the black pepper thing is a, is a little bit old. Okay. Um, we, we knew 15, 20 years ago that curcumin was good for you. And we also know that it gets metabolized by your liver very quickly. Okay. So pepper actually blocks the breakdown in your liver, which is why it's, you know, put in the same product so that the half-life is sort of like comparable. Um, that's old fashioned. Okay. You want something a little bit more exciting and, and, and sexy. So, you know, you can have it in a nanomycel, it can be microsomal, all of those things sort of increase bioavailability. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. I hope you guys are all taking notes on this stuff. Um, all right. So let's, let's talk a little bit. We're going to go back to the tenants just for a minute or two. And I love how you guys, if, if you're on video, if you're on YouTube, you can see what I'm like holding up right now. She breaks everything down by the tenants and actually gives it a score. So you can see what the supplements are actually doing in the different seven tenants. Can you explain a little bit about about what you've done here? Sure. So I decided actually the, after the depressing realization that you aged in the seven categories, I thought, well, okay, we need to organize the system to figure out what to do. Um, Because I would ask somebody, well, why are you taking a particular agent? And they would say, well, my grandmother's uncle's cousins told me it was good for me. Uh huh. I hear that one all the time. (laughs) Right, right. Well, you know, in the world of science, that's kind of crap, right? That doesn't hold water. So what I did is within each, for each agent, and this takes a lot of time. People are always like, oh, have you rated X? I'm like, I can't rate everything. Um, Because it does take a significant amount of time. But for every agent that is rated... I have looked up every scientific article and read through every possible thing to figure out what, if anything, it does in each of the seven tenets. And the rating system that evolved, because it started out as pluses and minuses and it became a number system, is if it does absolutely nothing, it got a zero. Right. If it did something um, in test tubes or in theories or in culture, it got a one. Uh, If it did something in animal models that were non-human, it got a two. And if it was proven in humans, it got a three. Okay. Um, So for example, uh, you'll see a number that's like 0.3.1.2, blah, 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 for seven numbers. And so it's sort of like a pseudo barcode. So when you go to develop a program for yourself, the idea is that you need equivalent points uh, in each of the categories. Right. Because if you don't, the last category is going to be the one that gets you in the end. Right. Right. So you don't want to just go through and look at all the highest numbers. And just I'm going to choose everything. that just has the highest numbers. Well, some people do it that way. You know, yeah. they want the biggest bang for the buck. Right. So right. they pick the highest rating ones. 
Um, I would argue that if you do that, line them up and see what you're missing, because okay. sometimes you're going to find that you're very deficient in a particular category. Okay. Um, if you are significantly, you know, deficient in a category and you lo load the points in that category, if, you know, if you're worried about your DNA or in the sun a lot, you've got a history of cancer, load up your DNA repair rates, you know, increase your autophagy rates. There are, the idea is to connect worries and concerns with the tenants and load the points. So okay. it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty easy system to use. Okay. Um, I, I found it very helpful and I started going through and, um, that's how I developed a lot of supplements, the plans that I take. And then of course I take other ones on top of that. Um, do you know anything about senolytic cocktails? Of the course I do. Big thing going on right of now. What do, you, what do you think of these babies taking them once a month and giving yourself a break? And is it actually working? Is it worth it? Do we do it? Um, I do. Of course okay. I do anything, anything that's, that seems like the rest, you know, relative risk benefit ratio is sort of on your side. The answer is why not? Yes. So, so to back up a little bit, what is a senescent cell? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if your listeners know what a senescent cell is or not. You better know what a senescent cell is, but go ahead and break it down for us. <laughs> well, the, the, e the easiest, I mean, people call them zombie cells. I call them grumpy old man cells. I love that. Um, and, and the reason I do this is because if you take a normal cell uh, and you give it enough DNA damage, it becomes either cancerous um, apoptotic means it's cell suicide or becomes senescent and senescent cells sit there and they are fat. They get this weird, goofy fat morphology. Their organelles stop functioning. They get weird protein inclusions and they exude these, you know, the SASP, which is the senescent associated, uh, senolytic phenotype, which is a whole lot of evil cytokines. And I picture the old fat guy at a company sitting in the lunchroom. He's been there for a thousand years and he's just the grumpiest dude. And he's just exuding negativeness to all of your other cells, right? You can just sort of picture this guy, yeah. right? And how do we get rid of that guy? That's, that's the question, right? right. And right. it turns out that you need some significantly high doses of very particular things, um, senescent cells are not all the same because they come from different cells, right? So a bony senescent cell may not be the same as a fat senescent cell or a brain senescent cell because they all underwent DNA damage and then changed, but getting rid of them is going to take different therapies, Okay. right? And they take significant doses, but you don't have to take them all the time because they don't develop. I mean, they, they slowly develop and then your immune system can get rid of them. But unfortunately, over time, you make more than you can get rid of. So you want to knock them down um, and then sort of like, eh, and then knock them down again. So what I do is I actually take several different things on a rotating basis with the idea that I can get rid of different populations at different times. Okay. That's interesting. So, of course, the, the most famous formulation is the DQ formulation. Mm -hmm. um, getting decinitib is a little bit challenging because it's a chemotherapy agent. And if you walk into your pharmacy or your doctor's office, they're going to choke and they'll never give it to you. <laughs> uh, but you can get it. It's possible. You can get it through different formulators. Um, and I take 100 milligrams two days in a row every two months. Right. All the studies have it with quercetin, um, and I take daily quercetin anyway, but I bolus it like, you know, about a four to five amount dose for those two days at the same time. Uh -huh. I don't necessarily know if they need to be taken together. I think they're hitting different cells, which is why it's effective. Right. Okay. Um, so that's one strategy. Uh, there's also, there's some strategies where certain antibiotics can actually get rid of um, some senescent cells, hmm. specifically in the, the erythromycin family. Mm -hmm. Erythromycin doesn't actually do it. Azithromycin does. So that Z-pack that you're taking every few years, that'll actually do it. Okay. Um, and then there's, there's rox, uh, was it roxithromycin that does it. Um, so I take, you know, a few milligrams, not a few milligrams. I take about, I forget what the dose is. I want to say it's 300 milligrams. And I do that for two to three days, every few months knock off another subpopulation. Um, and then I'll also bolus with some fisetin. I mean, I take fisetin every day, but I'll do some boluses on the off months when I'm not doing the quercetin on the assumption that I'm hitting a slightly different cell population. Okay. 
So is that, is that what you're looking for? <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. So now what about people who do intermittent fasting? Um, that's supposed to help with a little bit of the autophagy. Can you do that alongside of doing the, the cocktail? Does it become too much? Can we ever have too much? That's an excellent question. And the answer is, I don't know. Um, intermittent fasting is fantastic. It actually helps almost with every category. Um, it, you know, one of the reasons it helps is it's activating your AMP kinase, which sort of, as you go down the molecular pathway, does a whole lot of things in every category. Um, so it activates your sirtuins as an example. It activates your PCG1 alpha, which helps your mitochondria, for example. It does a heck of a lot of things. So you know, for people that can do it and people like, oh my God, they, like they fast for 18 hours every damn day. There's some guy that like I met that he doesn't eat for four days and then he eats for a day and then drinks water for another 24 hours. I'm like, oh my God, right? Good, you know, kudos to him, but that would drive me insane. That's much. Um, so you can, anyone can go absolutely crazy in any of these categories. What, how much is too much? And I, I really have no idea, but what I had decided um, for me personally, is that every time I read a study where they take two agents that kind of work synergistically, mm -hmm. if you reduce the dose, you lower the risk of side effects and increase um, efficacy. Okay. Uh, you know, and it's not true for every combo study, but most combo studies. So what I have decided because I take so many damn agents is that I take smaller doses of all of them because I believe they work synergistically. Yeah. I've heard you say that before. That's, I, I like that message. I especially like it as you're starting something new, kind of start low, go slow. Um, but I love how you, you talk about that. It's, it, it, you said, if the label says take two, you take one. So yeah. you just take one, one of each. Do you up it occasionally? Do you just stay at that one? So, you know, it's, it's funny. I, you know, I probably the same as everybody else. I have a pile of bottles sitting in my kitchen, right? Uh -huh. Um, so I, I, a different piles. There's the kitchen pile that I take in the morning. And then my lunchtime pile is, uh, is already pre-designated because I don't want to look like a drug addict in, in my office at the hospital. So that's just this little dish and it looks like a silly dish of candy that I'm just constantly munching on. So that part doesn't change, yeah. but the ones in the morning, it's, it's sort of funny as I go through and I take them, my mental Rolodex goes, aha, this is doing this and this is doing that. And this is doing the other. And if I feel particularly deficient, I'll take more of that one thing one day or more of another thing one day. So the doses get rotated sort of subconsciously. Right. Okay. And then of course the actual drugs that I take sort of sort of get rotated as well, but less so because I'm more particular about that dose. Right. Okay. Okay, cool. Uh, speaking of drugs, um, rapamycin. We said that we'd touch back on that. Let's, can we talk about that just really fast? Good, sure. good, bad, ugly, beautiful. I, eh, I think that it doesn't have a home yet. Um, there is no doubt that it has a role as, uh, you know, shutting off mTOR. The okay. problem with shutting off mTOR, mTOR controls protein synthesis. So it controls anything that turns over quickly and needs, needs a lot of protein uptake. So your gut, your intestinal cells turn over a ton right? Your muscles need a lot of protein uptake. Your brain, your hippocampal cells turn over repeatedly. Right. Um, and there is evidence in, in um, animal models, not in humans, that it can decrease certain types of memory, not all memory, but certain types of memory, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So yeah. absolutely turning mTOR off is clearly a bad idea. You're going to become frail. Your gut's not going to work. You're not going to remember anything. So you need some sort of partial turning off, but not entirely turning off. And, and people know this. So they're kind, they're trying to come up with strategies where you take a small dose once a week or a small dose every two weeks, or, you know, there's, there's people are trying anything. Okay. And as a physician, I live by the do no harm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and look at risk benefit ratios. Yeah. And in my mind, I'm only 54. If I'm going to be 120, I need to not be frail and I need as much memory as possible. So that is not a risk that I personally am willing to take. 
Yeah. I think over the next five to 10 years, they're going to figure out exactly what the formula is going to be to optimize people. But I don't think we're there yet. And I personally am not willing to go down that road. Yeah. Is there anything from the natural standpoint that will give us kind of sort of halfway similar? Oh, a hundred percent. So anything that activates AMP kinase is partially turning off mTOR. Uh-huh. So, you know, most of us are on a bit of metformin. Metformin is a partial mTOR blocker, right? right? So I think that that's plenty. Okay. What about berberine? I love berberine. Okay. Um, what's interesting about berberine is the molecule is completely different from metformin. They're not identical at all, but they do incredibly similar things. Right. Very, very, very similar. Um, and there's a fantastic study that demonstrated that if you take 500 of metformin and 500 of berberine on any one given day, you optimize effect and decrease side effects. Like, right. It's this, it's the whole idea of synergism. So yeah. that's exactly what I do. I take, some of one, some of the other. I used to take a ton of metformin and I actually, you know, it could have been stress, could have been completely not related, but I really felt like my memory was starting to slip. I came off of all metformin. A few months later, I felt normal and I went back on 500 and I feel fine. Okay. But right. that being said, of course, because it's a partial mTOR blocker, I don't take it within eight hours of exercising because I want my proteins to build my muscles, blah, 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 blah. And in fact, I activate mTOR with leucine um, sort of alternatively. So again, it's sort of, you need to titrate things to what your daily life is going to be. Right, okay. So another, I just need to come to Florida and um, follow you around for a day. <laughs> yeah, that'd, that'd be fine. <laughs> you would love it. We do a I'll lot of- here in February, here. so be careful about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll, you'll laugh because if you were at my house, you'd be like, okay, I'm going to make 17 skin products. That's fun. Uh -huh. uh, there is Botox and exosomes in my freezer. Um, this it's, it's the most ridiculous house. Um, my, my kids like have been, you know, they've grown up with this. So yeah. they're like, mom, I need a 30 gauge to get a splinter out. <laughs> or, you know, my other daughter used an 18 gauge with a big syringe to fill donuts. You know, it's just, how else are you going to get cream into a donut? Duh, house, right? Right. Binge, oh my right? God. Let's, so let's we have a lot talk, of toys. Yeah. Let's talk about exosomes. Um, oh, I love exosomes. Is that, that's, that's not for the regular person. I mean, you need to be you to get this kind of stuff, right? So they only sell it to physicians. Yeah. Uh, that, that is correct. And most physicians have no idea what exosomes are. Yeah. Um, so in, in a nutshell, uh, as you're, it's basically a stem cell product. Um, so your own stem cells put out exosomes. And so exosomes are basically little vesicles of goodness, right? It's like little juice boxes. Right. Um, contains um, anti-inflammatories, growth factors, all sorts of things that are very beneficial. Um, some people will go and get stem cell infusions. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you get somebody else's stem cell infusions, you have to leave the country, Panama, Mexico, that sort of thing, the Bahamas. Um, you can bank your own stem cells, either your hair, hair follicles, fat, et cetera, have them grown out on a culture and then re-injected. Um, you know, you can do it. It's very expensive. Right. Uh, a recent study demonstrated that 80% of the benefit of stem cell infusions actually come from exosomes. So in my book, get the exosomes. So much easier. So, I mean, they are pricey, but it's less expensive than going to Panama and paying 30 grand for a stem cell infusion. Just a little bit. Now, how often do you do that? Uh, once a month. Okay. All right. All right. So I, I buy them in bulk because someone seems to think that I have a, a, a practice or a company, which I don't, it's just me. <laughs> so I buy them in bulk. They're in my freezer and I defrost them once a month and inject them. Nice. Girls night. I'll bring the wine. <laughs> oh, you'd be, you would, you would love girls night. So I actually have this goofy thing as well called laser club. Okay. Um, and so uh, we have a friend of mine owns a factory, it's a warehouse, and um, uh, my laser tech boys come in. So we come, you know, so we come, we PRP each other, Botox, laser, whatever you want in terms of beating yourself up for beauty is what we do. It's pretty funny. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love that. <laughs> All right, I'm I'm giving you my dates. All um, right, I'm here. Is there is, is there anything else in parting that you want to share with people? Um, I, I think that 
I guess the big message is, is all of this sounds very confusing. Uh-huh. And, and the goal of my system is to make it as easy as possible. Um, understanding that that is an organization system for molecular agents or oral intake, but it's not the entire picture. So I like to think about longevity in terms of a pyramid, right? So there are things that you're going to do every day, one of which is these oral agents, and of course, diet and exercise. Um, I, I love red infrared light therapy. I think it also you know helps your body overall, increases your ATP output of mitochondria. But there are things that you do every day that should just sort of be what you do without thinking about it, right? And then there are things that you do less frequently. They'd be higher on the pyramid. So the senolytic therapy, any infusions, um, peptides, maybe. Some people do them every day. Some people do like little peptide boluses, depending on sort of how they're feeling, you know, and then there's things that you do less frequently. Some people are into plasmapheresis or gene therapy or that sort of thing. So I guess the the general take home message is create a pyramid for yourself. That's reasonable. That tries to address all of the ways that you age that falls into your lifestyle. That isn't too crazy because the idea is not to make this your life, but to allow you to have a life around it. I like that. That's that's great advice. Um, we're going to be hiking Mount Whitney. Sweet, nice. One day, <laughs> one day we will be. Of course, all the the snow and ice has to melt. We invite you to come out and hike with us. Oh, um, I would love to do that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's going to be challenging, I'm sure. Um, okay, hey, altitude, nitric oxide. Altitude is yeah. my my nemesis right now so i i am slowly working on my my climate side what is it what? read book two in the okay. back of the book you'll see something that says altitude okay. and it'll tell you what agents you want to take for altitude okay done, done. you can Perfect. change the cytochromes in your mitochondria and your electron transport chain to better resemble that of a sherpa to change the way you process oxygen and you'll be better off you are a wealth of knowledge. You are a wealth of knowledge. Well, I only did it because I was going to Aconcagua. I'm like, I'm going to die unless I do this because I'm at sea level. So I, I did it. And the interesting thing about it is you, your, your sats seem worse, but your energy is higher. Okay. So if you put on your little Paul socks, you'd think that I was dead, but my energy levels were absolutely fine, which okay. is kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, as I'm talking to um, Bill Andrews, Dr. Bill Andrews, a good friend of yours, and um, we mentioned uh, coming Mount Whitney. He was like, oh, mm-hmm. yeah, we we ran that twice. I'm like, Oh, that guy's yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, from, probably, yeah. From yeah. Thousand Valley to, to Whitney. It's like, oh. <laughs> yeah, that man is amazing. He's crazy. He's brilliant. Yeah. One of the smartest men I know. He's amazing. He is. I'm, I'm looking forward to um, taking a tour of Sierra Sciences. It's going to be an amazing day. So. Um, but anyway, Sandy, thank you so much for being on the show today. I, I could truly talk to you for like another five hours, but um, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But thank you for sharing your knowledge as well as a little bit about your protocols and solutions. And I really encourage everybody to go out and get both books are available on Amazon. Um, they're called the Kaufman, Kaufman Protocols. Um, the first one is Why We Age and How to Stop It. And the second one is Aging Solutions. Can you see that up there? Um, I will make sure that links are in the show notes. Sandy, if somebody wants to learn more about you, um, they should travel to, over to your, I guess, your website, maybe your Instagram. Uh, absolutely. So the website is very easy. I am not the most clever person. So the website is kaufmanprotocol.com. <laughs> very easy. And Mm -hmm. if people want to ask me anything, uh, the email address is on that page and I answer all questions. And I do warn people that it is just me, me and me alone. I don't have a secretary. um, So it takes me a little while to get to all questions, but I do get to them. So people always get angry after a few days and they resend it to me. I'm like, dude, like, give me a break. This is like a hobby. You know, it's it's a hobby and I do it for free. So you need to give me a little slack. Um, And then I generally post any Thing that I'm going to be on uh, on the Instagram or anything I find particularly interesting, which is why the uh, the substance was on it uh, a few weeks ago. Right. Um, so that is Kaufman Anti Aging okay. on, on Instagram. Okay, very good. And yeah, you guys definitely follow over there. 
And if you have any questions about this show, please head over to our Instagram page at Becoming Ageless Podcast and drop your questions underneath the show's poster. And um, if I can't answer them, I'll make sure that I get a hold of Sandy and get her to answer them for us. And of course, if you want to find out anything about me or catch up with me, you can find me all over social media at Robin Lynn, R-B-Y-N-N-L-I-N. And there I share my own tips for both living agelessly, like climbing Mount Whitney, as well as decreasing bio age and increasing health span. So our show website is becomingagelesspodcast.com, where you can catch up with all of the past episodes. And I encourage you to subscribe to stay in the know. And if you enjoyed today's show, I would so appreciate it if you would go and rate it on your favorite podcast app and then share it with your friends, because after all, you want them to grow healthy and stay healthy longer. So you have people to go out there and adventure with. And of course, you can find all the links mentioned in the show notes below. So you guys, thank you for being with us today. And I hope you'll join me next time here on Becoming Ageless as we uncover new tips, tricks, actions, and science to increase your whole health health span. Stay ageless, y'all.